Welcome to the Spirit of Mayflower podcast with me, Rachel Carter. I'd like to welcome to the podcast two very special guests, Dr. Anna Scott and Richard Daniels. And our topic this time is Children of the Mayflower. And it's a special version because uh, the week that the podcast is going out is Baby Loss Awareness Week. So welcome to the podcast, Anna and uh, Richard. And I'm going to start with you, Anna. And let's delve straight in and talk about some of the children that was on the Mayflower, because as we've heard from previous episodes, it wasn't just adults. It was a mixture of young families on board the Mayflower. So what do we know about these children? We know their names, so, so you get a sense of who they were from that. And yes, we know some of their ages. So sometimes we just know that they were the son or the daughter of a particular passenger. Sometimes you can work out what their ages were based on records that were from Holland, where some of them lived before they went on the ship, or from when they were in England as well. So um, we tend to know as well a little bit about the, the young children. So there were some some very young children, uh, some toddlers and, and some babies were born on the ship as well. Uh, out of the passengers, do we know how many of those passengers were, uh, was made up with children? There's a really, um, I'm, I'm just going to point you towards a, an interesting website for people who might want to find out a little bit more about the passengers. It's been created by um, American ancestors who are a group in New England in America um, who re do a lot of research about their New England um, ancestors and they've got a particular Mayflower section and you can search on there to see who was on the ship and when you um, when you search you can search to see how many men there were and how many women and also how many children and they have got listed 32 children on the ship and there were a total of 102 passengers so that gives you an idea of, of how many how many of the how many of the passengers were children? There's just about a third of them. Gosh, that's quite a big number, isn't it, for that kind of journey? 32 children. It is, yes. And so you're absolutely right, saying that they were they were families that were travelling together. So um, not all of the families had uh, everybody, uh, all of the members of the family were travelling. Sometimes families have had to leave people behind. Uh, so one of the um, one of the most famous um, people on the ship was called William Bradford, and he was travelling with his uh, wife, and they had left their son, who was a three-year-old, in Holland, um, hoping that he would come over at a later time, because they obviously were taking some big risks in in their journey, and they perhaps wanted to. Um, send him over when they'd once they created uh, somewhere for them to live but it was it's quite a sad story in the end because uh, Dorothy uh, William's wife fell off the ship and drowned once they got to America so she never did see her son again although he did come over later when he was older. Right gosh um, that's creating such a such a vivid picture there that you know to leave your child behind and then undertake that voyage only to when you get there um, have an accident and fall off the ship and drown it must have been quite a terrible time for for Bradford to be apart from his family but also to have lost his wife after such an arduous journey yeah, I imagine it was. It, he, William Bradford um, tells a lot about the story. Uh, and so he's actually the reason why we, we know so many details about what happened with the Mayflower and all of the various journeys that happened before that. Um, but he doesn't say ever so much about his wife's death. When it happened, he was um, out with a, a scouting party looking for somewhere for them to live. So um, he would have returned to the ship to find out what had happened. So yeah, it must have been, must have been a dreadful time. Yeah. And so you mentioned that as well as um, all of these children on board the Mayflower, that there was also some of the passengers were pregnant. So what, what do we know about these uh, individuals? Yes, there were three of the, the women on the ship were pregnant. Uh, uh, one of them had a stillbirth, so 
um, that must have been a terrible thing to, to have to manage. And uh, the other two uh, women had, had their babies. Uh, one was called Oceanus, so named after the sea. Um, although he unfortunately didn't live for long after they arrived. And the other baby that was born was called Peregrine, uh, which actually means pilgrim. Um, and, and he did live um, once they got to America, once they were established in America. Right. Um, and Richard, this seems um, a, a good point to bring you in on the conversation because uh, you started your own charity called Forever Stars to support families who suffer the loss of uh, a, a baby. So could you tell us a little bit more about your story and your charity? Yeah, sure. Um, it was uh, in December 2013 that uh, my wife and I um, uh, had Emily and unfortunately she was born uh, as a stillborn baby. And um, we'd, you know, we were aware of, of, of stillbirths, but until it happened to us, we didn't really realise the, the impact of, uh, of stillbirth on, on you as parents, as well as to the wider family. And uh, um, we felt that um, whilst the, the care that we received at the hospital was absolutely fantastic, the actual resources there to support families just wasn't quite hitting the mark. So um, in January 2014, we set up a charity called Forever Stars and initially um, looked to uh, build one bereavement suite where families could spend time with their babies and um, you know, do naming ceremonies and, and just come to terms with the loss before they had to go back into the real world, really. And, uh, and from that, just so many other things have, 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 have developed for the charity now. So it's ranging from supporting counselling. Um, we have two suites now in the city of Nottingham. Um, we do a, an awful lot for Baby Loss Awareness Week. Um, we try as much as possible to paint Nottingham pink and blue. So hopefully in a few days' time, you'll see lots of buildings being lit up pink and blue and, and flower beds going pink and blue. Uh, and even to the point now that because of, of, of COVID and the difficulties of, of meeting up, we're asking people to light up their homes and have their front windows sort of pink and blue to, to show support because ultimately there's one in four families that, uh, that suffer baby loss. And uh, so it's, it's, it's more common than people probably think. Yeah. And uh, so to, to let people know that, that there's organisations out there to support them, we think it's a, a great thing. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful um, that there's that support there. And uh, you've done such an amazing job with the charity. Um, and I suppose with baby loss, um, you know, has been around for such a long time. People having babies, there's been... Uh, unfortunately the loss of them or and the loss sometimes of the mother as well so Anna I'm going to bring you back in just quickly on this um do we know much about the the lady that um suffered the loss of her baby when she was on board the Mayflower and what kind of support she might have been given her name was Mary uh Mary Allerton her, her previous name before she married was Norris and she was probably born around 1590 um, in England. So she would have been about 30 when she was, went on to the Mayflower. Uh, she was married to Isaac and she had some children already. Uh, her other children were called Bartholomew and Remember and Mary. Um, they had some interesting names, some of the, the Puritans at that time. Um, she she also um, had a, a child that she buried in Leiden, so that's um, the place in Holland where some of the pilgrims lived before they uh, left England on the Mayflower. Um, so uh, this 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 was something that that she'd obviously experienced uh, already, and then she gave birth to her her son, the stillborn stillborn son, uh, when they got to Plymouth in Massachusetts in the December. So they left England in the September. They had a, a long voyage, it was 66 days, took them to get over to um, Massachusetts. And that was in November when they arrived. So she would have uh, given birth uh, while the ship was moored, uh, while they were looking uh, to set up a home on land. Um, but then it, it, it's, it's quite sad when you read that she, she died in that first winter herself. Uh, a few a couple of months later um although the rest of her family did survive but i i imagine uh she she just obviously 
given birth, I imagine she would have been uh, possibly quite weak and it, it would have been a very difficult winter already. They didn't have um, the best food and it was very cold and there was sickness around. So, um, but she, she, she wasn't the only one um, in that position to obviously uh, be unwell because within the first year, around half of those passengers had died uh, for different reasons. So yeah. it was a struggle for everybody, really. And a few of them didn't get quite as ill as the others, and they were key in actually looking after other people. Um, but it was a struggle for all of them in that first year. Yeah. Gosh. So thinking of, of today and, um, and families um, bereaved and losing their, their children, um, so... So Richard, the, the fact that you've created this charity and set up bereavement suites, because it's obviously it affects the, the whole family, doesn't it? Um, and everybody grieves in a very different way. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about your, uh, your bereavement suites? Yeah, sure. I mean, you, when you look at Mary and Isaac and think about the fact that they'd have given birth and, and lost their baby, surrounded by lots of other families, um, you know that when you lose a baby there's a real there's a, a real feel feeling of isolation and you know to to see things carrying on as normal around you must have been absolutely horrific so that's really where the bereavement suite came from it, it was an opportunity for families to take a few days out or as many days as they needed to have that sort of um bubble which is a popular word at the moment but to have that bubble where they can just stay together as a family whether it's just mum and dad or whether it's you know grandparents brothers and sisters of, of, the, of the baby so they can you know create a lifetime of memories that's the whole point of the bereavement suite you know you 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 you're not just losing a life you're losing a whole lifetime of aspirations for your child so you 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 want to spend as long as you can with them um, you want to create those memories and um and so that's what the bereavement suite's all about and so you know you you, you can only your heart just feels for from mary and isaac when they suffer their baby loss having gone through all the things that they've gone through with their their travels and already having lost a, a, a baby already, you know, to, to go through all that and then to lose their child as a stillborn, it was supposed to be awful. But, mm. you know, times have, have, have really invested because people have really suffered in the past. We're really investing now to make sure that people don't feel that isolation and that whether it's baby loss at the hospital or whether it's baby loss at home, there are things there that they can, that there are uh, organisations they can work with. Yeah. So, what you're describing is that support bubble for families now and um, maybe that with the travellers uh, banding together and particularly with half of them dying in that first winter, um, I suppose the people that survived that first winter, Anna, would have formed new families and new support groups as they were losing and being bereaved. Uh, so what do we know about the uh, families and the children in particular after that first winter? I think it's quite interesting thinking about how families organised themselves back then because I think sometimes you assume how it perhaps was when we're talking about 400 years ago so it's it's not within living memory it's it's a long time back uh, and when you, when you speak to Americans today who are descendants of the pilgrims for them it's often 12 or 13 generations ago so so it's quite a period of time. Um, but it was interesting how they did, they, they, they realised that having strong family units was important for maintaining families and sustaining the children within those families. So um, once uh, one of the parents died, um, perhaps the mother or the father, it didn't tend to be that long before they would remarry, particularly where there were, were children in the family, because in actual fact, that created a unit of mutual support um, for, for the surviving members of a family. And if you think about a situation where you've got a group of people uh, very far away from the homes that they would have known trying to survive that first year, um, they would have really needed to, to work together to support each other. Um, so um, that was one of the ways that they managed it. And the other thing was that they didn't tend to marry ever so young so they would wait until they were perhaps in their 20s they, they weren't getting married uh, too young and so they weren't having their children too young which would help actually to sustain families 
uh, for longer, given the risks around um, childbirth and pregnancy? Yeah, well, I think this is um, a great place to hear um, one of Mary Brewster's imagined letters. And we have featured this letter before in the podcast, but I think this highlights perfectly the uh, the difficulty that the three preg pregnant women must have faced whilst travelling on the Mayflower and uh, we'll hear from Mary Brewster. Voiced by Ella Pritchard of Highcliffe Music. The Mayflower, 15th of October 1620. 40 days at sea. My dearest patients, I am pleased to report that, unlike my last letter, this one starts with very good news. We had several days of grave anxiety after the damage to the Mayflower's main beam. As I said, it was feared that we would sink, and many of the crew wanted to abandon the voyage and head back towards England. But, as usual, the Lord had the situation well in hand, and was pleased to use his servant, Moses Fletcher, our blacksmith, to fashion a repair of the beam with a great iron screw. Then he and the ship's carpenter worked together to prop it on a post set into the lower deck. We trust in the Lord that so repaired the Mayflower will take us at last to the new world. We have plenty of tradesmen on board to build our new dwellings on arrival. But for the life events, the coming into this world and the leaving of it, we women who have been at birthings and laying out of the dead on land must now deal with these things out here at sea. But the good news continues. Elizabeth Hopkins has been safely delivered of a healthy son. Her labour was long, more than two days and a night. I stayed with her until the boy appeared with a loud cry of protest. She has named him Oceanus in honour of his birth at sea. She is very tired, but so delighted at his safe arrival. I fear the children now know a great deal more about how they enter the world, probably too much. It is strange that after so many weeks this life below deck is beginning to feel normal. We have our routines and make do as best we can. We managed an hour above deck last night and had a celebration to give thanks for the survival of the Mayflower and the birth of Oceanus Hopkins. I caught sight of a young couple who, thinking themselves unobserved, were in very close quarters. In the glow of the evening, I recognised John Alden, our barrel man, and a very good-looking young fellow, happily entwined with Priscilla Mullins. The sunset was beautiful and they were silhouetted against the orange sky. They seem very much taken with one another, and I predict that we will have a marriage to celebrate when we arrive in the new world. Seeing them reminded me so much of your father and me in our youth. How lucky we are that those dreams we had back then are now coming true. It is fortunate that we had no idea of the trials we would face in the years to come. This morning, me and Priscilla Mullins went up on deck to wash the birthing cloths for Elizabeth, for she is still too weak to tend to this herself. I asked Priscilla how she had enjoyed the evening's celebrations, and she responded with coyness and girlish blushing. What a treat it was to be out of the fetid stench downstairs. I fear that the air below is not helping Dorothy Bradford to recover her spirits. There is little daylight, and because of this, the distinction between night and day on this voyage has not struck me very much until now. Any small beam of light that sneaks through a grimy porthole is unable to penetrate far into the tightly packed mass of bodies. It feels like a glimpse of hell. Yet, this morning on deck it was so calm, with almost no breeze at all. The sense of space and freedom was the most striking thing, and... Viewing the vastness towards the horizon, it just looked as if we were sailing on a perfectly circular pond. Now I must tell you news of a miracle. John Howland is a strong young man who was going up to the deck during a storm. The ship lurched and he was thrown overboard into the swirling main. He disappeared below the waves some fathoms down and was feared lost. But by the grace of God he was able to catch hold of the top sail halyards hanging overboard and, with a great effort, the men were able to pull him aboard to survive. He was quite sickly from the salt water he had swallowed for some days, but is now looking more hale, praise the Lord. Captain Jones told your father that he thinks we are less than a week from making landfall. Praise the Lord, for I am not a happy sailor, and would never take a sea voyage for pleasure. Heaven knows what you think of these letters and my wobbly writing. 
Very much love to all. Mother. P.S. Trust in the Lord. So, Richard, um, I'd like to come back to you now. And um, so, as many people will, have, will know that I'm creating sculptures for the Mayflower, but I'm also creating sculptures for Forever Stars. So, you got in touch with me a couple of years ago and you had this idea, didn't you? That's right. Um, we've, uh, we were very aware that we'd, we'd put a lot of resources into supporting people when they'd initially lost a baby. But actually, once they left the hospital environment, there was still a need for um, a, a focal point for the baby loss community. And so we, um, as we have the Serenity Suites in the hospital, we decided that we would look to develop a Serenity Garden in Nottingham, which would become a, a baby loss remembrance garden, somewhere of real tranquility where they could come along and and just, just have the thoughts of their babies. And, and, and actually, it's particularly important for the older generation who've lost babies because quite often they haven't got a grave or somewhere they can go to, to, to remember their babies. So there was a, a, a multi-layered reason for having a, a Serenity Garden in Nottingham. So we've, we'd seen some of the beautiful work that you've done, Rachel, and, and, uh, and it just made absolute sense to, to involve you in the, in the project so that we had some... some, some, some poignant pieces in the garden that uh, families could, could come to and, and uh, you know, have a, a remembrance piece for their babies within the Swansea Garden. And, and we're, we're now uh, um, just in the, in the process of seeing that garden being developed now with the, with the hope that it'll be opening in uh, May 2021. Well, um, I can share with listeners that I'm creating not one, but two memorial sculptures for Forever Stars. And um, one of them is a giant acorn, and uh, I've been busy weaving away on that one. And the second sculpture is going to be a large star, and they're going to be placed within the garden. Um, and they'll be installed at a similar time as that uh, we're going to be installing quite a few of the Mayflower sculptures. And next year is quite an important year because it's also the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving. And so I wanted to bring the two of you together as guests because of um, the sculptures that connect my two projects is in one respect a way of giving thanks to the people who've survived, but also to remember those who've lost their lives. And um, Anna, is there um, any other resources that we can look at uh, that talks about the, the children that survived that uh, journey on the Mayflower? I've just got some baby crying. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm baby, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm lasted really well. And I'm just... <laughs> so we'll, we'll come to you first, Richard, while uh, Anna tends to her baby. So um, if people are, are moved or, or touched by this story or have indeed themselves suffered a loss, um, is there any resources that they can go to to either for support or if they're um, within the area of uh, Nottinghamshire, uh, where can they go to find out a little bit more about Forever Stars? So if they want to find out about Forever Stars and some of the projects that we're undertaking for baby loss families in and around Nottingham, then we've got a website, which is www.foreverstars.org. And that'll talk about all the different projects that we're involved in. It'll also have our contact details. And, and we do love people to contact us. Um, we have a really active social media page on Facebook, which is just called Forever Stars. Um, and uh, we also have the same with Instagram and Twitter. But um, in, in addition to that, Nottingham is actually really growing in terms of its support for baby loss families. We've got a, a very proactive Sands Nottingham um, and they've got some um, befrienders who will help families that have recently lost uh, a baby. And equally, um, based at the City Hospital, there's Zephyrs, which is a, a, a facility, a very relaxed, really lovely facility where people can go along and just meet other families and just talk about their experiences and, and if they're needing specific help, then that will be provided from there as well. So there's, a, there's an awful lot that's been developed in the last few years in Nottingham and, uh, um, you know, and we'll keep doing that um, because obviously baby loss is, is, as, is, as much as it's been around 400 years ago, it's still going to be around for another 400 years, unfortunately. And uh, we want to make sure that that baby loss journey for anybody is as comforting and, and, and supportive as possible. 
So uh, I want to thank you both so much for being part of this podcast and uh, I, I understand that um, baby loss is never a, an easy topic to discuss um, but uh, I want to thank you for being part of this special episode. So thank you very much for the invite. It's really important that we have the, the conversation about baby loss and that you know it's, it's things like this podcast that makes it a more approachable subject so thank you very much for the invite. Oh, you're most welcome. And uh, Anna, I hope you uh, you get little ones sorted. Thank, thanks for having me again, Rachel. It's been really interesting to chat about these stories. If you'd like to find out more information about Mayflower history and any descendants that may have come from the Mayflower travellers, then head to mayflowerhistory.com. If you'd like to find out more about support for anyone that has suffered a stillbirth or neonatal death, then head to the SANS national website. It's sands.org.uk. And if you're in Nottinghamshire, head to foreverstars.org. And do join me for the next episode of the podcast where I'll be talking with Catherine Summerwell. Uh, she's part of the Manuscripts and Special Collections at the University of Nottingham. And we'll be talking about their forthcoming exhibition, Beyond the Mayflower. Spirit of Mayflower is part of a series celebrating my Spirit of Mayflower project. You can get involved in lots of ways. You can take a look at some of the movies and pictures I took on my journey by heading to the Rachel Carter Sculpture Facebook page. You can also head to my website at www.rachelcarter.co.uk and there you'll be able to view some of the sculptures I make, treat yourself to a limited edition Pilgrim Woman sculpture or take a look at some of the online tutorials 